We're in the 60s. But leading up to that, my parents were, 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 were very interesting people. My father and mother, early in my life as I grew up, I, I realized that they were fighting for rights for African Americans. They were involved in the community. They were involved in their work. They were involved in uh, trying to bring attention to the needs for freedom and opportunity and equal rights. So they were a part of that. So as we moved into the civil rights movement, I was already kind of aware and in tune with the kinds of things that were being done. So already that kind of pulled me into that experience. And I began to see, hmm, what are we dealing with? And in particular, here I am as an African-American young person. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming through from Boston Latin School. Uh, I had summer experiences in New Hampshire where I was one of the few blacks to attend a summer camp where I was first a camper and then I went on to be a counselor to teach and uh, work with student children during the summer and what have you. So I had a broad experience within which I was living as an African-American, as an American. So I had all that experience going into the civil rights movement and I got caught up in the whole issue and the concern as to where we we're going. But somewhere in me, I had a glimmer in terms of what is possible for us to begin to work through that long-standing predicament for African Americans for America that originated in the theory of the founding fathers to free African Americans from slavery. They remained enslaved and that stayed with the country for so long as much as it talked about providing freedom and opportunity and fought London or Great Britain to England to free itself. It still had this this peace that it has failed to attend to and it's carried through to this day where we have the continuation of the issues and problems of civil rights that got a big thrust back in the 1960s. I'm gonna stop now because I don't wanna be running too much. I can be throwing pieces in, but that, that that's kind of like a flow, Miss Banks. I mean, Yeah, and I feel like you're talking about a lot of, you covered a lot of these different things. So part of what you were answering is that um, your parents really kind of paved the way for you and you kind of observed what they were um, doing in terms of their own activism and trying to make sure that, you know, people were getting their rights and people were um, really participating in the civil rights movement. Um, were there, like, what was civil rights like in New England, in Boston? Because in other parts of the United States, I think civil rights looks or was a lot different, especially when you talk about the South um, ah. and a lot of the leaders that were active during this time period. Okay, so it's like, what was the nature of civil rights in, in New England? Yeah, what was it like for you? The yeah. <clears throat> the thing about New England, and this is part of what I picked up from my parents and their relationships, is that actually that area was seen as the beginning of the American Revolution. The first American to die in the American Re Revolution was an African-American, Crispus Attucks. And he was celebrated for his death in, the eight, uh, uh, in uh, 1770 before the actual start of the, of the civil rights movement. So there was always a push within New England around Boston for, civil, for, for freedom for America. And then as we moved into the whole uh, civil war and, and that whole thing, the whole fight for freedom so that was an atmosphere for a part of the country trying to take leadership, trying to take the lead in terms of helping the country to move forward to fulfill its promise of America for everybody. So I was in that kind of an atmosphere. That doesn't so it was mean, more liberal or more well, open? In a way, there was that element. There were, there were issues within the city itself. There were folks who were not so liberal and back and forth and had those kinds of give and takes. But there was a strong focus in terms of, hey, this is a seed of freedom. This is the, uh, the, 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 the background for, for, uh, uh, for civil rights leaders. So he came out of, uh, out of New England, out of Boston. So it had that thrust. There were issues, but yes, it was seen as more of a- uh, More open. Yeah, more, more, more in tune, more, more, more willing to take the initiative. Uh, so first of all, does anybody have any questions? Cause we'll yeah. keep, I have, I just want to open it up if anybody has any questions about what he's talked about so what far. What they about. think about so, the whole thing. So you speak Latin? 
That's yeah. a question. Oh yeah, here's one for you. I might not pronounce it right. <laughs> Wenny, Venny, Vidi, Viki. That's a st statement. You know from whom it came? Julius Caesar. <laughs> and in those words, Julius Caesar is stating that I came, I saw, saw, that's my Boston accent. I conquered with relation to his campaigns to yes. advance the, uh, the, the domination of Rome as they moved into what is now France, what was back then Gaul and, and what have you, so. So you studied the classics. You, someone said they used to learn Latin in their old school. Yeah, and so you studied ancient Greek, you studied yes. Latin. Greek. Um, Greek yeah. Hold on, I, there's a question that just came up. That's Great. cool, sorry to mean to cut you off. Um, you mentioned that you were one of seven black students from like seventh through 11th grade. Were you discriminated against during school or were you guys separated <laughs> from the other students that weren't of color? Oh, that's a great question. I had issues that I had to work through. First of all, we started off with 12 African-American. This was all boys. They had a girls all Latin. Boys this was all boys in downtown Boston. Started off a class of maybe 250 students. 12 of them were African-Americans. That was going into grade seven. As I graduated in grade 12, we ended up with seven. So issues, yeah, there was just some discomfort in terms of being one of the few Africans, Americans there with a group that was primarily white. And there was some issues. And I remember one day uh, I was waiting to go into physics class and I was standing around and a white student came up and rubbed my head. Now my head was a lot more shaven as it is now. Uh, but I used to have pretty close shave. He rubbed my head. Now, in those days, that was seen as a, um, a demeaning act to show toward a black person, to have a white person rub your head. My brother had told me about it. So there were incidences, but there were also situations where I made wonderful friendships and with people from various backgrounds, Irish, Greek American, and it, it was a mixed experience, but I was able to get a lot from it. I'm sorry, I don't mean to make awesome. these so long. No, so that's great. Have, we don't have a whole lot of time. It's okay. This is great. Um, there's another question. Would you say it was really tough living during the 1960s? I mean, like, <laughs> did you feel comfortable? Good. I love these questions. It was a mixed bag. In some ways, yeah, I felt comfortable because of what I was into. So, for example, I would go off to the summer camp in southern New Hampshire called Camp Union, and it prided itself on bringing together young people from grades from ages eight on up to 15 as campers to learn about outdoor life. That was a very great experience for me because I rose to become a counselor to work with other young, to work with young students. And they had other uh, young people like me, this is all, all men, but you know, they were African, they were white, uh, some Hispanic and some Asian. So we had a mix. So that was like a foundation for me as I went through this period. So I had this as a reference point but I would get upset when I watched the things that would happen on TV as I watched the, 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 uh, the, the initiatives from Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders. And I watched what was happening around the country in terms of sit-ins sit and all that. So here I am with this experience of knowing what it can be with people who, to live and work together with each other. But I see America across the country in the various degrees begin to struggle with all this. So I'm saying, whoa, how do we get out of this? And then when, bing, I got to give you this one piece. And then I'm going to add to it after you get a chance to talk. As a senior at the University of Massachusetts in psychology, I was fortunate to be able to conduct research in psychology, my senior research thesis. I was able to do that. I was selected because of my, my academic work over the four years in, in psychology. And the topic that I focused on, it was an actual research project. The actual uh, topic that I focus on is the effects of race, racial background on relationships between people in one-to-one -one interactions, person to person, teacher to student, whatever it might be. I conducted that research and my senior year at University of Massachusetts, I passed the requirement to get it recognized as, as an honors project. And from that point on, I actually got it published in a professional journal, a journal of clinical psychology. And in doing that with the help of my professors and what have you, I said, ah, with all of this confusion and turmoil and difficulties and pluses and minuses, I have a sense as to where this can go. 
And that's part of what I'm going to leave you with as we pull this together. So there's a couple more questions that just came in too. And that actually kind of segues. So was it difficult for you in college? I think um, (laughs) basically like experiences or maybe with your professors, do you feel like how like they may have treated you like a certain way or um... right exactly okay so i went to college i grew up in what was called roxbury massachusetts which was like the ghetto right in the city of boston it was black african-american and then i went to the university of massachusetts in amherst some 100 miles away from from uh from boston from roxbury and i entered in the, the, the entering class, fresh, freshmen, men and women, and I was just one of 12 African-Americans coming into that freshman class. So here I am leaving, uh, leaving Boston Latin School as one of the few, and I'm going into to, uh, UMass as one of the few. Well, what I did was I set about doing my work. I, I think I had situations I had to deal with. I made friends, but it was I, I could navigate through it. And then I began to find professors that I could work with that gave me that kind of connection. And then from those kinds of connections, I began to meet more people. So basically having a sense of, first of all, from way back with my folks leading into all this, I say, yes, I'm African-American, but underneath it all, whenever the circumstances circumstances have been for African-Americans and to some extent for me, underneath it all, I'm an individual. I am a human being. Now, am I perfect? No. Am I better than other people? No, but I'm an individual. And I need to recognize that and build with that because that is what I'm going to bring to all of these relationships with other people from similar or different backgrounds. So I begin to get a handle on that at University of Massachusetts, which gave me a base for then moving on to my graduate work at Harvard and University of Massachusetts and other kinds of stuff. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. There's more questions coming in. Great. So Great. Love them. how did you feel getting a master's uh, at Harvard? How was it? <laughs> and then right. uh, yeah, go ahead. Right. How did I feel attending such an outstanding uh, facility? Well, yeah, I went there. My father went to Harvard University and this was way back in, in, in the 1900s. He went and he didn't quite finish because his, his family couldn't afford to carry it through. But I had that connection with Harvard and I realized I was going to a very distinguished place. Harvard University was, was supported by William Monroe Trotter, an African-American who received the title of the guardian of Boston. And he was my father's mentor and he's a mentor of a lot of other young African-American men and women. So as, as I went there, I went in there with with this sense of prestige, but as I had a sense of my individuality and this whole issue of race, I begin to say, oh, some of the stuff they're laying out with, I, laying out, I agree with, some of it I don't. So I begin to get into some little interactions with my professors, some positive, some negative. And I begin to say, Harvard's wonderful, but it's not all that what it's cracked up to be and that it's better than all these other places, UMass that I've been to or other places I could have gone to. So I kind of got Harvard in perspective, great respect and pride and honor graduating from there, but hey, another institution with a range of people that you get to work with. Woo-hoo, I'm going, going. Okay, so I have a, a question. Um, yeah. Did black members of the LGBTQ plus community, like the gay community, et cetera, uh, experience racism differently than their counterparts who were not a part of it? Okay. Do you have this- experience with this? Yeah, well, because uh, one of my coworkers, as I got forward into uh, uh, coming out of, uh, 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 man, go, going on to, uh, to Washington State, but uh, also coming out with my, my PhD from State University of New York at Buffalo in a long way, I had friendships with those of the LB, LB I, I'm sorry, I never- LGBTQ plus, it's okay. LG, you know, I'm trying, that, the community- yes. The that uh, were more quiet and careful about their, their identification. But okay. I began to work with my friend, my friend Patricia, and we had an exchange as a part of our working relationship where I got educated as to her experience. And we talked about tying our experiences together and she and I became very critical coworkers in going ahead to continue to learn and make a difference because she was careful about 
her uh, revealing her identity, but she shared and she grew and she took, uh, took initiatives, actions to help support the community in advancing and recognition and fair treatment. And do you think that she may have experienced more racism or did you observe anything like that? Or is it hard because like you said, she kind of kept, she was more- She did, with she did because people were, people are strange and they're, they're very suspicious and they kind of look, you know, looking, well, what's with this person, you know? Or some so of the friends- kind of more I, guarded. Yeah, and some of the friends I had at, at Harvard and I, I know they were being protected protective about the experience. So it, it was more of a, 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 a protected, well, yeah. They were more off. guarded. Here, yeah, guarded, that's the word, thank you. Gotcha, okay. Um, <laughs> why do you think racism based on skin color still exists today? Shouldn't people be educated that it's wrong? I know there are other problems that racism focus on, but I just made it relate to the topic. Is this a question from a student? Yes, Fantastic another student. question. Now, and I have another you know, one after that. <laughs> Guys, hey, keep going. But, these are great questions. No, these are questions because as you ask them, also be don't just get Dr. Banks's answer. Be thinking about your answer because what I'm trying to do is promote our capacity, which is very strong, to think. We've got yeah. a freedom to think. So think about your answer. As you hear Dr. Banks, you might say, well, I don't agree with everything he says. I don't care how distinguished he is. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> because we got to think about all this. But, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, go ahead. So what was the question? So, no, it's okay. So why do you think racism based on skin color still exists today? Shouldn't right. be, people I, be I, educated that it's wrong? Okay, you can't educate them. I'm just finished. It's interesting I'm having this paper. I got a website coming out. And, Ms. and I'll show you guys this in a second. I had a chance too. to review it. And, I, and I'm writing a paper. And son of a gun, what, what did I do with the cover of the paper? All right, my, my, my paper is that there is a direction for the United States of America to move toward this. And this is important because if you go, not just to the civil rights movement, but you go back to the early 1900s when my father and William Monroe Trotter and others were fighting for civil rights. And then back prior to the civil war, prior to the revolution, there's always been this attempt to fight for freedom. Now, what's missing? What's missing is understanding the starting terms of our country. And this is not a criticism of the United States of America. It's an observation in terms of strengthening in it, all right? When the Thomas Jefferson and the founding fathers in their fight to get freedom from England, England in part wanted to control the colonies because the colonies were advancing economically through their use of enslavement. Now, what happened in England is that it, it abolished slavery. It actually went, it went around abolition of slavery. And they said, we have abolished that we have to insist upon the colonies that they abolish it. The founding fathers, the leaders of the colonies emerging America said, no, this is our choice to have enslavement. And the reason for saying that was of the economic, extraordinary economic gain that slavery brought to them. Anyway, with that, what the, what the Thomas Jefferson did in creating and working with the founding fathers, the Declaration of Independence is that he established or they established the inalienable rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness as the terms of freedom. Yes, this is going to be freedom. This is going to be a free country because we enable citizens to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Oh, my goodness. Who did they leave out? <laughs> they left out the slaves, the ones they were using to make money. So that was the root of this problem as we go along. So as we look at this day and time, we have the whole civil rights movement that continues. We have the protests, the claims, all the activities, Black Lives Matter, everything that's happening, okay? Okay. That's one part, and I go back to, if any of you play sports, I don't mean to make this whole thing into a sports game. But There's actually other, a question too about what your opinion is on Black Lives Matter's protests, so you're okay, right on. Okay, it falls right in. Yeah. In addition to all the protests, there needs to be an added ingredient so that we have a two-phased approach. It's like if you go play a game with somebody and you're playing softball or you're playing uh, 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 football or basketball, whatever it might be, soccer, you got a two-phased approach. You got to play defense. 
You've got to go after the competing team and keep them honest and keep them on the defense. And that's kind of like what African-Americans have been doing with America. They've been on, on defense taking, I'm not saying they haven't made tremendous strides, tremendous strides and actions and initiatives to say, hey, we don't accept this. We're going to continue to fight it. In addition to that, you have to have an arm, an initiative that goes at the fundamental problem, the fundamental problem that originated back with the uh, Declaration of Independence is that the founding fathers, under their broad of umbrella of freedom, forgot and overlooked and probably didn't know how to identify two things. One, that Americans have the, 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 the capacity for the freedom to think that they can, be, they can use to identify, define, and implement human effectiveness. And that's the second part. And I can give you on and on and all on that. And the website will be getting into all of this and that. But when you have a two-phased approach, you got defense and protection. You got Black Lives Matter, which brings everybody uh, to task in terms of paying attention to what's happened and what, what needs to be happen. But we also have an initiative that's going at the fundamental base, the foundation that gives rise to these issues. Because it, it's, it's like a, it, it's, there's, there's a picture there, and you'll see it in, in, in the website. As you elevate the freedom to think and identifying, defining, and implementing effectiveness, you create a vac, you, you squeeze the space that all of this stuff has room to operate in. Discrimination, uh, 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 systemic racism, bias for, for uh, all, not just African-Americans, but for all Americans to varying degrees. But as we, uh, as we lower that, then there's more room for this ugliness to thrive as we increase it, which we know how to do in this initiative for it. And again, I lay that out in the website. I started anyway. Then we begin to bring that down. So as one goes up, the other goes down. As one goes down, the effectiveness and thinking, it goes up. So that's what we're dealing with. And that, for me, points us to an approach as to move forward, that we continue this extraordinary thrust of the civil rights movement, from Martin Luther King to Vernon Johns to all of those folks, to keep that going. But add to it the capacity to begin to say, ah, what do we begin to build in that we never really got started in the United States of America? And you know what happens? This is not only going to benefit African Americans, but the varying degrees it's going to benefit all Americans, all Americans, because when you begin to identify, hey, we got the freedom to think, to identify by defining and implement effectiveness, not only does that help the circumstances of deprivation that have existed for African Americans, but to varying degrees, all Americans have had that had difficulties related to that, and it helps to strengthen them for as well. And this is not to downplay what the country has done. The country has done extraordinary things with contributions from all Americans, African Americans, white Americans, what have you, but we're looking to move ahead. <laughs> That is a lot. That's great. Well, you, um, have, you tell your students, they're asking wonderful questions. They're going to keep yes. this man going and going and going. I know. I'm going to ask um, just two more questions. I think we're going to need to wrap it up. We can definitely do another guest. Can, can we just uh, show the video? Uh, yes. And then what was the U.S. like with the assassination of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King? Uh, that's a whole long one. <laughs> okay. All right. First of all, I'll tell you what my feeling was. Utter anger. I was furious. And I feel that as I move on, I am addressing some of what has been learned from the legacy of John F. Kennedy and the legacy of Martin Luther King, and that we have lessons that are identified and learned from history. And as we understand the second phase of helping, we got to learn that it's not enough to be aware of the lessons, but we got to take a look at how to implement them. And we have that. So this little video, I want your folks to look at, your students, your wonderful students to say, hmm, what is this telling me? And then I'll tell you what, what the intent of the video is. All right, so 10 seconds through 46. Yeah, All right. you can just start it. And we'll definitely need to do a part two of this because I know. <laughs> All right. There's a lot to unpack. Great. Here you go. This is me. Started there. Boston, Massachusetts. Riding the bus to the Boston Latin School, the oldest public school in our country. I viewed an image of effectiveness on a poster 
on the inside wall above the window of the bus. As a young black male stood at the side of three young white males, one white male said to the other, So what? He can pitch. Okay, that's it. So that's my question closing. is, what is the message there in terms of all of these challenges that we're trying to face? And then I'll give you my take real quick. Anybody want to add? First of all, every one of you think about what does this say about this whole challenge of dealing with these difficulties from that one little image that I shared with you, which was my image as I rode the bus every day on the way to the Boston Latin School. I had this image here and it stuck with me so much. It is now part of my uh, infographic book online called the uh, from, 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 from Bondage to Prosperity. What is this? Yeah. What is this message? What is this? What What is the message that? that what, what is it telling us? Anybody want to add? Or I'll just go ahead and add it. I know we're running out of time. I keep. Anybody take a guess? What's it say? Like, what are the takeaways from this? Um, like we're the same people. I'm guessing. Like, we're the same yeah. people. Yeah, we're the same. Like you, we're the same people. Like, Absolutely. Same Beautiful. All right, let me go ahead and so you guys can finish up. And what it means, yeah, you can just say what, All right, what why this, it's significant. I remember I told you a lot of my background. So I'm riding along this bus and the civil rights movement is starting. <clears throat> and I've been learning about my hero, Jackie Robinson and the Boston, a whole, all kinds of stories. And I'm looking at this one little poster and it's saying, hey, George Banks, they used to call me Butch. What's this telling you? What's this telling me is that the most important thing that we need to account for as we go to work with each other is effectiveness. Now this shows boys, it's the same for girls, it's the same for older people, it doesn't matter. This happened to j just be a group of boys that was illustrated on the Boston bus taking me to school. But the first thing we wanna do is account for effectiveness and how do we get that? By identifying, hey, I get the capacity, I get the freedom to think, absolutely. And in doing that, I want to account for effectiveness. What's the most important thing about coming together like this as a, as a mixed group of people? Hey, he can pitch. Do you want to win? <laughs> and awesome. You look at the sports where the big money's made, like in the NFL and the NBA and all that. Are they sitting there? They don't do it as much. They, ha they have a history. I'll tell you that another time. They don't do as much because they want to win and they want to win to make money. Anyway, I'm done. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think like I don't like when people make it seem like because of their uh, race, the talent their talents have to be exact same like because exactly, of their race. it doesn't have to be because awesome. you recognize each each individual. Awesome is right. Each in, when you say effective, each individual brings her or his type of effectiveness that you combine with others, and that's what makes the difference. And that's what we got to put as an emphasis in terms of where we need to go, how we move forward. And that's the track I'm on in terms of the things I've laid out by way of uh, the website in this brief presentation, which has been a, a, indeed an honor and a thrill for me to talk with you all. You wonderful people. I'm so excited about our exchange here. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. I just want to thank you again for your time. And uh, Sage just said, thank you for taking time every, off your day and sharing your experiences and opinions. I really enjoyed hearing your view of things. So thank you very much. And thank um, you all. Yeah. So everybody could say thank you, Dr. Banks. Um, I'm sure we'll see you again soon. I look forward um, to it. And I wish you all well. Yeah. And thank so. you, Ms. Banks. <laughs> <laughs> you are a wonderful teacher and learner. Yeah, you're getting, a oh, thank you. You're getting nice. a lot of love in the chat too. They're all saying thank you. So, okay. Thank you. <laughs> All, All right. right.